Okay, welcome everybody. We are super excited to have Barry Friedman here to talk about his latest book, Unwarranted, Policing Without Permission. Uh, Barry is a professor at the New York University School of Law, and he's um, spent the last 30 years writing and teaching and litigating about issues of constitu constitutional law and criminal procedure. He is also the author of the book, The Will of the People, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times and Slate and the New Republic. Um, also joining us is Deborah Jones. Jacobs. Yeah. Jacobs, I'm so sorry, Jacobs. Um, who is the director of the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight here in King County. Um, she's got a long career um, working in um, executive leadership positions of the ACLU, uh, specializing in policing procedures um, and practices. Thank you, Anna. Thank you all for coming. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, it's my first trip to Seattle uh, and certainly to this campus. So uh, I'm going to start by telling some stories about policing. Uh, I could actually start with the Dallas shooting of Jordan Edwards, which is kind of a tragedy because I tell so many stories about policing having gone off the rails. I also uh, always stop at this point and say that I spend a lot of time now working with policing agencies and with policing officials trying to fix some of the things that have gone off the rails and there are a lot of great people in policing who want to get it right uh, and it's important for us all to be there in a kind of helpful mode to get that to happen. So I'm going to tell you some stories and I have a question for you because I'm a law professor and the question is, I want you to think about these stories. I want you to think about these stories. <laughs> that was subtle. I want you to think about... <laughs> Uh, and I want you to think about these stories and try to think about, if you can, what they have in common. They're going to seem very, very different to you. So this is uh, Freddie Martinez. Freddie was physics trained. He works in the tech industry in Chicago. He's an activist. This is a stingray. I'm just curious being here. Who knows what a stingray is? Everybody knows what a stingray is, or a lot of people. So I'm going to tell the few people who don't. We'll clue them in. So a stingray is a cell tracking device. The police use it to figure out uh, where a cell phone is or what cell phones are in the area. Uh, it has some incredibly important uses for policing. If you think about a kidnapping, for example, and you've got a cell phone number and you want to figure out where the person is, very helpful. Uh, it also, however, can be used to record the phone numbers of everybody that's at a protest, and that was Freddie's interest, which was, you know, were the Chicago police collecting uh, at Black Lives, for example, protests, the cell phones of people? And he was trying to think about a way to engineer something to defeat the stingrays. Uh, and then somebody said to him, you know, why don't you just file a Freedom of Information Act request? So he filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and he was stonewalled for a very long time, and so he hired or he joined up with this man, Matt Topic, who is a lawyer in Chicago, uh, who litigates freedom of information requests. In fact, Matt was involved in the release of the Laquan McDonald video in Chicago. And what they learned was that the Chicago police had for many years been using stingrays. Uh, and when they tried to dig deeper and ask a lot of questions about, you know, did you have court authority? Had you vetted the legality of this? Were, what were you doing with the data? Were you storing the data? They got stonewalled again. Uh, the city of Chicago hired a firm and quickly spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on not answering any of their questions. But while that was happening and they were getting kind of non-responses, people started to notice around the country that the same non-responses, almost in identical language, were appearing from police departments in California and in Georgia. And eventually people pieced together what was happening, which is that the FBI had gotten stingrays into the hands of local law enforcement agencies with non-disclosure agreements that said that no matter what, they couldn't reveal what technology was being used. So for years, law enforcement agencies had not been getting court orders or lying to judges and getting court orders. There was even a clause that said that if you were in the middle of a trial and you were about to say what the technology was, that you had to, the prosecutor had to dismiss the case and there were instances where that happened. And so that's you know, one example of law enforcement use of technology and we'll be back to that. But here's a different story. So this is Tamir Rice. Uh, Tamir Rice, as I think all of you know, was uh, playing with a toy gun in a park in Cleveland and somebody called the police and said that there was a male with a gun in a park. Uh, the police responded. Dispatch never relayed the information that it might have been a candidate, it might have been a toy gun. They came flying into the park in a squad car, they, a patrol car. They stopped within just feet of Tamir Rice and within seconds an officer had jumped out and shot him twice 
left him on the ground bleeding. They didn't have any emergency uh, care uh, equipment. It took several minutes for EMS to get there, and as you all know, he died. This is Charles and Etta Carter. So Charles and Etta Carter uh, lived in, outside of Philadelphia, very humble jobs for many years. They had one kid who got her PhD in developmental psychology, super proud of her. She gets a new job in Florida working in the school system. She gets married. They buy a new house. Everything's new. So they do what good parents do. They loaded up a van full of stuff that the couple might need. And they went down to Florida. And they stayed for a couple of months. And then when they were done, they turned around and came back. And on a really, really hot July day, they were stopped by the Maryland State Patrol. And all the Maryland State Patrol ever said uh, was that Charles had been driving wobbly or weaving. They took them out of the car. They put them up on an embankment out of the van. They started to take everything out of the van. They tore open bags of laundry detergent, breakfast cereal, wedding invitations from her daughter's wedding. They tossed the wedding dress out uh, into the back. Uh, fortunately, it had been wrapped up and wasn't destroyed. Took out lawn chairs, took apart a refrigerator. Uh, and all the while, the Carters sat out on this embankment in the heat. They called a drug dog in. The drug dog urinated around their belongings. Uh, and eventually, uh, on several occasions, Etta Carter, who had a bladder problem, asked if she could use a porta potty that they had in the van. And the police said no. Uh, they threatened to cuff her if she got up again. And so, uh, on a day that was her 40th anniversary, she uh, was forced to sit on an embankment and urinated all over herself uh, while the officers looked through uh, her belongings. They eventually let them go with just a warning, uh, never an apology of any sort. Uh, they went to a rest stop so she could clean up. They went back to their home in Philadelphia. They had several sleepless nights, didn't know what to do. Uh, eventually went to the AAA looking for help. The AAA sent them to the ACLU of Maryland. Uh, and there was a lawsuit filed. It was eventually settled. But the truly remarkable thing was that throughout the entire litigation, uh, I'd read through all the depositions, nobody in the Maryland State Patrol ever thought that anything had gone wrong, that anything had ever happened outside of procedure. Uh, this is a slide just to tell a story of a fellow who uh, was an Iraqi war vet who uh, wakes up in his apartment complex in the suburbs here in the United States. And because he'd been on many raids himself, knew exactly what was happening when he woke up to gun barrels in his face. He just had no idea why any of it was happening. Uh, it turned out that his apartment was being undergoing some maintenance. And so the department development had moved him into a different department. Some of the neighbors wondered who was in that apartment. They called the police, and the police responded with a SWAT raid. He went down to the police station the next day and said, investigate, call the apartment complex, ask security who was in that apartment. And they said, you know, we don't investigate. It kind of gets in the way of our apprehending suspects. Uh, this is just, there are, uh, you know, you're driving under the influence. Cops want to give you a breathalyzer, but if it's drugs, the breathalyzer won't work. So it's become, in fact, it's becoming increasingly common. I now get calls about this all the time for, particularly in the Midwest, for police to take folks to the hospital and have them forcibly catheterized uh, to get a urine sample. And um, including a case where a fellow who refused to sit still for the catheter was strapped to a gurney so that they could insert the catheter. And then just a quick reminder that the NSA, uh, as we all learned from Edward Snowden, was gathering the metadata from all of our uh, telephone communications and also some of our internet connections. So the question I have uh, that I ask folks all the time is, what do all these seemingly different stories have in common? And uh, we don't tend to think of them as the same story here in the United States. We think about racial profiling. We think about militarization. We think about technology. We think about use of force. But my argument in the book and in the work I do with the policing project that I've started is that all of these stories are united by uh, a governance failure, uh, which requires me to teach you all of a minute of constitutional law. Uh, so when we think about government in the United States, we think about democratic accountability. And I uh, divide that up into front end and back end accountability. And we know all about front end accountability. It's what you think of when you think of democracy. It's the idea that we have rules that we put the rules in place before officials act so we know what they're going to do. They're transparent. We know what the rules are. Indeed, we have a voice in what those rules are. There's always some form of public input. We try when we can to make sure that the benefits outweigh the costs. Now, we have back-end accountability, too, which is to say what keeps that system running and keeps it honest is that we have courts that make sure that everything that's supposed to happen up front happens. But it's the upfront part that we think of as democratic uh, accountability but not in policing. 
In policing, for bizarre historical reasons, we have almost no front end accountability. And all of our accountability is on the back end. It's things like inspectors general and civilian review boards uh, and court appointed monitors and body cameras, the sort of stuff Deborah deals with and she'll talk a little bit about. Even body cameras, if you stop and think about them, are back end accountability. All the stuff on the back end is designed to kick in when something bad has happened to say, can we figure out was somebody responsible? Did something go wrong? Is somebody to blame? But what we don't do around policing, and this is the key thing that I think has gone wrong, is we don't involve the public on the front end to say, how do we want to be policed? What should the rules be by which we're policed? Should we all know what those rules are and have input into them? And the interesting thing is, when we do have that input here in the United States, when something happens to cause us to have that input, for people to get annoyed and speak up, policy changes. Policing changes, so I'm sure you recognize this picture as one of the images from Ferguson. After Ferguson, there's a big debate about militarization. That debate goes on around the country, and as befits a you know, federal system and a democracy, different governments, different states at the local level all adopt different policies about what should happen with the military equipment. Some decide to keep it, some decide to ship it back, some decide that it's gotta be online what equipment the government has so that folks can respond, some decide that the government, actually, the police have to come to the city council or whatever and ask to get the permission, but the policy changes. Uh, similarly with drones, a lot of states are now adopting drone legislation because people are focused on the use of technology around policing. And even after you know, the Snowden revelations, though it took Congress a long period of time, eventually what happened is there was a big debate in Congress and we decided that the government shouldn't hold all that data and instead it should be held by private companies and should only be available under court order. So when we get the public involved in the front end, which we don't do very often, policing changes. And the last kind of big point I wanna make with some more images is that this ironically is good for the police. So this is the sell to the police, but it's important. So there's been a lot of talk about legitimacy of policing, about trust in policing agencies. Well, it's not that surprising that people don't trust and that there are legitimacy issues when people aren't engaged and when they don't have a voice in what happens. And so when there are things like stop and frisk, hundreds and thousands of people a year in New York, uh, or when there's surveillance going on that people don't know about, then in fact, when people learn or when people observe that, there is a huge loss of legitimacy and trust. And that's painful for policing agencies, which you need to understand and what progressive chiefs understand is, you know, in fact, we're working in Camden and uh, there's a horrible incident of an eight-year-old girl that was shot and killed in, a, in, in crossfire from a, a gang fight. And somebody came forward, a very wealthy person uh, uh, elsewhere in New Jersey and offered up a big reward and nobody took the money. Because what happens is that in these neighborhoods, when something goes wrong and there's a shooting, nobody cooperates with the police, nobody wants to speak to the police, people are threatened, they're afraid to speak to the police, and it's that lack of legitimacy and trust that keeps us from getting that engagement with the public. But here's kind of an ironic story. So Compton, uh, yeah, part of sort of the sprawling place that is Los Angeles, the Police department decides, the LA Sheriff's Department decides that they're gonna try out some surveillance technology, big airplane in the sky, remarkable resolution, track crime that way. Eventually, people find out it's in the newspapers, people are extremely angry. Uh, remarkable statement by the public information officer for the LA Sheriff's Department says, look, when we did this, we knew that people kind of get nervous about Big Brother, eye in the sky, so we thought we just better kind of keep it hush hush and not tell anybody. Uh, obviously, people were unhappy when they found out and that was the end of it, but down the street in Lancaster, exact same technology, public debate, they decide to use it. And that happens time and again. It's happened with drones. It happened here in Seattle. Uh, the police department got some drones. People learned about it, were extremely unhappy. They eventually had to ship them to LA just to quiet the tempest. So uh, the you know, idea I wanna leave you with is that bringing front end accountability to policing is really important and makes a difference. I started an organization called The Policing Project to work on those kinds of issues. Uh, we do lots of different things, but I just want to mention a couple that I thought would be of particular interest in this room. So one thing that we're doing is we're working all over the country, bringing community voice to policing, trying out different models of bringing the police and the communities together to decide how they want to be policed, uh, often working with, uh, as you might guess, extremely marginalized neighborhoods, communities of color. Uh, the other thing that we're doing, which astonished me when I started to write the book, so, you know, I didn't believe then, and I very much believe, don't believe now that we're safer because of all this policing, and I'm very curious about the efficacy of policing practices. So I said to my research assistants, go forth and get me the literature on cost-benefit analysis of policing. And they came back with not very much, and I said, no, seriously, there must be 
you know, we spend $100 billion a year on public safety, there must be studies, shockingly little cost-benefit analysis done around policing. But the one extraordinary fact that I learned was in all of the little skimpy literature there was, no attention paid whatsoever to the social costs of policing. So we might ask, look, we can hire this many more officers, we can do this many more stop and frisks, does it make us safer? We have some estimates of the cost of crime, but no one ever asks the question, what, how do we monetize a stop and frisk? Like, what is it, what is it cost, you know, what's the value on being stopped and frisked? Or what's the value on community trust if it's lost when that happens? And so around street policing issues, around technology, which is, you know, one of the really huge issues around policing right now is the growth of technology. These are the kinds of questions we need to answer. That's all from me. My friend Deborah is now going to talk to you a little about what she does here in Seattle. Thank you, Varian. Thank you. Thank you so much to Anna and Eves and David for hosting us. It's really exciting to be here and see how you all live. Um, so I, after working more than 20 years for the ACLU, I decided to settle into work specifically digging deep on police practices. And the reason I kind of went to single issue work is I see this as the most critical area of civil liberties. It's the most direct, immediate, dangerous confrontation between the government and its citizens. And it's also the gateway to mass incarceration. And for me, for those reasons, it really rose up as some place where I'd like to dedicate my time. So, you know, there aren't a ton of systems to hold police accountable. During the Obama administration, we've seen unprecedented uh, engagement with the DOJ. I think he sent the DOJ out more on police practices issues than probably the last five or six presidencies combined. It, that was kind of, it's a, really a new thing. But as we know, the administration has changed and I think we have lots of evidence to see the rollback. So what's left for accountability? And you could also really question how the efficacy of DOJ intervention, you know, some success stories, some rollbacks, we'll see uh, what happens in Seattle in particular. Um, but civilian oversight is another way of holding police accountable. My office is one of 150 offices around the country that engage in civilian-led oversight efforts. And by the way, I'm not in love with saying civilian because what's it, it's versus military, right? And I don't particularly want our police to be militarized. I also don't want to use citizen because that excludes a big chunk of our population unintentionally, I think. And uh, But for now, it's civilian oversight. No two offices are the same. You can't do apples to apples comparisons. And there's no one best uh, model, one best practice or way of doing the oversight. What my office does is sort of three key functions. When the So one thing is we oversee the King County Sheriff's Office. That office covers all of unincorporated King County and about a dozen jurisdictions that contract for its services. So that's Burien, uh, Shoreline, Beau Arts, uh, Maple Valley, Woodenville, um, Muckleshoot Reservation, and a bunch more I can't pull off the top of my head. And um, so when you're in Burien, you might see Burien Police, and then you'll see a little King County Sheriff under that. So we have, compared to the Seattle Police, a really diverse geographic and otherwise area. So you can't even compare how Seattle does things to how King County does things. Um, and that's something to be mindful of. But so what the activities my office do are, one, when the sheriff's office completes an internal investigation, we look at it to see if it was thorough and objective. Is there bias in the investigation? Have they crossed their T's and dotted their I's? Two, we do systemic reviews, use of force trends, training issues. One of the things that drives me crazy about the training, there's statewide, there's a 24-hour annual training requirement. And at, at least at King County Sheriff's Office, that's all done electronically. None of it has to be in-person training. And I think there are huge costs and issues around that. Three, we do community outreach. That's me right here, right now, talking to you. And for those of you who think you're covered by an area of the King County Sheriff's Office, I'd love to talk to you because we have opportunities to engage you. And I need some help, people, so identify yourself. And then right now, we um, in November 2015, the voters of King County voted to expand the authorities of my office to include individual investigations. The King County Council has just passed an ordinance to do that. And now that ordinance is subject to collective bargaining with the 11 different unions that represent the law enforcement that make up the King County Sheriff's Office. So this will be a new experience for me to see, you know, can we hold on to these voter endorsed rights? It might interest you to know that in Washington state, a, a collective bargaining agreement has a higher legal authority than uh, an ordinance or even a vote of the people. So, um, so I'm, 
trying to live out some of what Barry's talking about. And he's correct in saying a lot of what we do are the back end solutions. What can come on the front end? So in our new ordinance, one piece is to have input on policies before they're adopted. Non-binding input, but input nevertheless. And that, as it happens, was the piece of the ordinance that they fought hardest against. And I don't, I'm not sure what that means, Barry. You know, how, how much is that related to uh, defensiveness of like, no, we decide how we do it. Um, but the future is what Barry describes. It's when people talk about community policing, most of us get in our head, that's a cop out of his car in the community to talk to people. I think we need to take a more aspirational viewpoint, which is um, that community policing is about the community through democratic processes, setting the priorities of what the police should be doing. And Seattle has great precedent for this when we, God, how long ago, 20 years ago, passed a law that said marijuana should be the lowest law enforcement priority. I don't think that's been done here or anywhere else since. And But it's the idea. It's like, well, what, what do we care most about in our community that we want police to do? And what we don't want them to do, how are we going to make up that difference? So um, technology, I just want to say a couple things, and then I'll um, not take up any more of the time. I know you want to ask Barry a lot of questions. But uh, one thing is a big issue with police is adopting technologies without having thoughtful processes for the policies behind them. So I just found out that King County Sheriff's has been using a technology that there was no real analysis of like what what are the privacy rights? How is this going to be properly stored? Or you know all those issues. So I think for those of you in the tech community, if you're interested in policy around privacy and technology, there's a lot of room, and I personally would love to have your help if that's something you're engaged with. Um, another issue is uh, better technologies for police. So one thing I said at lunch, if you want to become a billionaire, is come up with a great non-lethal way to stop people. Tasers are sometimes non-lethal, but if you have an underlying medical condition, many hundreds of people now have died from table taser applications. And that's what they rely on now. It's tasers. You have a gun on one hip, a taser on the other. And unless they're coming up fast at you, you're going to take your taser and give it a try. But it's not always reliable, and they don't necessarily trust it. Um, so they are, by the way, they've already exper experimented with uh, web, like a net you can shoot. But the newest trend is sticky sticky gum that you shoot and people, it's like a cartoon. And you go on YouTube and look for like the demonstrations. But they kind of stop people from being able to move. Those are not in use yet. There's a lot of room for that. And I think it's necessary. And then finally, um, one thing I noticed is the underlying systems with which policing is managed leave a lot of room for uh, improvement, there's an industry standard called IA Pro, Internal Affairs Pro, where all the data is kept in most police departments. And there's so many shortcomings to those programs. And so this is an area where I think there's tremendous need. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a big body camera fan. I'm not against technologies inherently. I think they need to work for the, the people. Problem with body cams, among other things, is they only face one way. Um, and I think where you have something like a dash cam, where you're performing in front of it, although they can also avoid those. So a lot of issues there. And I really appreciate your interest in this. My office is one of only two independent oversight offices in the state, the other ones in Spokane. I'd love for you to take an interest in what we're trying to do because it's really about the future. What kind of accountability can we as citizens assert in these dynamics? And it's a work in progress trying to get it right and lots of challenges, but I can't think of a more important field in which you could um, share your talents. So thank you. And I'm going to help moderate questions for Barry because I love just being up here and talking. Come on, Barry. <laughs> we'll take So who has a juicy question, or even a just not juicy one? Thanks a lot for the great talk. And I can't wait to check out the rest of the book. Uh, my question is regarding uh, firearms. So this may be a naive assertion, but it seems like in the United States, police have firearms that are maybe more dangerous than others. Uh, and in fact, I think in the UK, most police don't, aren't even equipped with firearms. So like, is that a unique situation to the US? And how do firearms play in this whole, situ this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the cultures vary everywhere, right? So in the UK, they largely don't have firearms. I just read a story in the newspaper that uh, that, that knifings are up in the UK, so that's what gangs use are knives. Uh, and it, apparently, somebody tells me also just kind of fold people over and compress them until they expire. So, you know, we all come from different cultures, and things are done differently in different ways. We know that we come from a very uh, Rambo 
cow person culture, and uh, that involves a lot of weaponry. And, uh, and, you know, it's a problem for the cops. I mean, it's interesting. If you talk to cops, they don't love concealed carry laws. They don't love open carry laws. They don't love everybody having a gun. It makes their job a lot, a lot more difficult. Hi. Uh, so it seems like community policing is one of the best ways to get the police more engaged with the community and to get the community to see the police as a force that will help them as opposed to just arrest them or enforce the laws on them. Uh, this is kind of a question for both you and uh, for King County, but what's stopping us right now from just rolling out a larger community policing effort? So uh, first I just want to draw a distinction which Deborah drew between community policing and community engagement because I think it's important. So community policing as you identify as a way to get the cops out of their cars and walking around and meeting people in the community. And generally, you know, we should favor that as a method of policing, though uh, we should also be conscious of unintended consequences because we always have them around policing. And so, uh, you know, there was some community that had this idea that it would be great if on Friday afternoons the cops would just come up and high five all the kids coming out of school. And, you know, a lot of parents were like, whoa, we just don't really want the cops around high fiving anybody. And, you know, that's a function of a loss of trust and a loss of legitimacy. Um, we were moving toward a community policing model in this country, and then we had a war on drugs, and then we had a war on terror, and it's hard to have community policing when you're at war. And so Sue Rar, who is the former sheriff of King County and now runs the training facility, talks a lot about the difference between cops being warriors and guardians. But a lot of departments are moving toward community policing models. The NYPD's moving pretty quickly toward one. We're doing some work in Chicago, uh, and they're trying to move themselves to set up that kind of community policing. So it's the right, it's the right direction. I would just start in one other thing is resources. You asked what stops it is resources. Um, there's so many differences in capacities of police departments and you know how many people are they doing? King County happens to be an extremely lean department. So I'll give you an example to compare it to Seattle. In Seattle, they've done amazing work on their crisis intervention in terms of um, people in behavioral crisis. So if they get a call, for example, with a suicidal, possibly armed person, they'll spend up to an hour. First of all, they'll have an officer there that's been trained and certified in um, they call it CIT, people in behavioral crisis. And then um, they'll spend up to an hour trying to engage them from outside, giving them lots of time and space. You know, you all saw um, in Seattle a few weeks ago, downtown was shut down because there was a knife wielding man and there was a confrontation with the police that, that took like two or three hours to resolve. They were using, I think, the greatest tool of all, which is patience, you know giving that time and space to the community members in order to engage. But you have to have the capacity, you have to have the physical resources. In King County, the sheriff's deputies ride alone. Seattle, they ride in pairs. And in King County, you could be up to an hour from your backup. Uh, so that also influences and also just the rural nature of a lot of the land. Uh, so I think one of the challenges in coming up with good solutions to reform policing is to make it scalable. And so, so when, you know, when, uh, I don't know what department, when Tukwila hears what Seattle's doing, they're like, ugh, you know, we, we can't do it, you know? So thinking in those terms as well, what's possible within what you have. Thank you. Okay, I have a bunch of questions that I was trying to select one. Um, I keep changing my mind up back there. So, um... You can have two, it's a special day today. <laughs> All right, I'll do two, so that I'm just gonna stand here and freak out. <laughs> so like, and I start really freaking out now. Um, so one of my question is, I guess more for Barry, because I guess uh, you'll explain it. Um, why, um, in terms of, you know, your focus, you chose policing, because, you know, there are other, enforcement people, I don't know like what you call those, that um, also affects the life of the um, civilians, like for example, the DEA or like the immigration. Um, so yeah, that's my first question. So um, I'm gonna give you a rather personal answer to that question. So uh, I, I hit a point in my career for various reasons where I really wanted, I felt I wasn't enough publicly engaged in what, it, what was it that I would, uh, do and when that happened, uh, and I was thinking through that, uh, I was also writing this book. And you know, of course, I didn't reach the obvious conclusion by adding two and two together that policing would be the thing to do. Uh, and then um, Snowden happened, and I realized that I that the ideas in the book mattered a lot in the real world, and that I could maybe apply them. 
And then as we were working on how to set up the policing project, Ferguson happened, and it's been kind of like being shut out of a cannon since then with the work that we do. And by the way, I want to follow Deborah's uh, discussion about what all of you can do, because in our work, there's huge needs for technology. Um, but the but so you know I that's the path I took because it's what I knew. Uh, uh, but I think that many of the same issues that I'm raising about policing and front end accountability completely apply to prosecutors. They may be more independent than anybody else in the system, and so it's a perfectly fair question. But uh, you know this problem feels this big some days, and so it's all I can kind of grapple with. Thank you. You want another one? Yep. Good. So my other question is um, how much cop. Um, partnership or cooperation you have with the police department or <coughs> the various policing people? Because I assume, you know, there's, one, there's always this old story about that's a good cop and bad cop, and, you know, um, a lot of people go to the job because they do feel that they be from becoming a police or law enforcement, they are doing good things, and so they won't want to grow up and get their job and become hated by, you know, everyone. So how much cooperation is there, or how is that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we, you know, the policing project, we uh, work with policing agents, agencies all the time and with communities. So it, depending upon the community, we're kind of in a different role. In Cleveland, we're working with the federal monitor doing community engagement in terms of getting the community to have input into the monitoring plan there. They're under a consent decree, to, you know, following Tamir Rice to deal with use of force issues. Uh, in uh, Camden were there because the police chief asked us to come in and help him engage with his, his community and deal with some of these issues. We're setting up a, you saw on the slide, an advisory council in Tucson. We're working with the LA Police Commission. It's the only civilian run police department in the country uh, to ask the question of the public, what do we do about body camera footage after there's been an officer involved shooting? And so we, we often feel like we're operating in a minefield. We talk a lot about walking a very thin line. Uh, I'm very careful about the things I say in public because the public is there, the community is there, but also the police, and and it's easy to alienate one or the other. But the goal is to try to bring them together, and I uh, try to, Anna and I were talking about this, I try to think the best of people in every situation and assume that they're acting in good faith uh, and are often in just bad situations. and. I have found that if you, it, it's slow, slow, painful work. It is really remarkable how hard some of it is, but you get these glimmers of, of sunlight when people are communicating with one another and progress is being made and the police realize they can listen to the community and it's not threatening to them and that the community actually is supportive and has ideas for how to do things differently. And the community realizes that the police are not just there to terrorize them, but actually are folks who came to the job originally thinking that they would do something good. And so that happens too seldom, but when it happens, I think it's pretty magical, and that's the idea. If you don't mind, I'll also throw in a two cents on that one. Hands down, the hardest part of my job is trying to work both collaboratively and adversarially with the department I oversee. Um, I'm very fortunate because our sheriff, John Urquhart, is very progressive. He, for example, has taken a strong stand about uh, not enforcing civil immigration enforcement for the federal government. He also has been great progressive on drug policy issues. Um, but, you know, we're, as I described, you know, we kind of review what they do. So it's like, wah, wah, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and you have to, you want to find your common areas and march those forward and also deal with the pain points. And people in my field get fired all the time. I don't think I even have any friends who have worked in this field who haven't been fired from their jobs eventually, you know, because um, you have to be pro-community and collaborative with law Love enforcement you. as well. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's a struggle and, and frankly is, you know, calling on the depths of my maturity to the extent there are any. <laughs> you know, I just, if you think about it in government, and it's important for what I want to say about what the, you know, uh, tech community can offer. The front end and the back end of policing should talk to one another, just like everything else, right? So I am party to a lot of anguished conversations with folks that are angry that police officers have not been held accountable, that they've not been indicted. And part of the reason is because we are not clear enough on the front end about what we expect. The standards are very, very big. So you can't have a very effective back end unless you've got a front end that's got legitimacy to it and that tells people what's expected of them. And by the same token, you know, what Deborah does, she's got exactly the right model going in the sense of if you're on the back end and you see where there are problems, 
then that ought to inform how you want to have new policies on the front end. And it all ought to work that way in a healthy way. So even though it's adversarial and also collaborative, that's how we're supposed to be in terms of being self-critical about what government's doing and then improving it. It doesn't happen that way very often, but that's the, the idea. You can ask a question? Yeah. Or are you just holding up the... Yeah, I'm just <laughs> hanging out over here. Now, um, so first, thanks for coming today. I've really enjoyed both of those talks. Um, but so I was going to say, I have a lot of friends that are cops. And with everything that's been happening recently, like we, we talk a lot, I guess, about you know what, what they're doing and what the community thinks about it. Um, and one thing that I found is they really, they kind of think that like a lot of policies that are there to like protect citizens are against them. Um, one specific example that I can think of is in Seattle, you have to pull someone over only for the thing that you're pulling them over for, which is different from other places. And that makes sense to me. Like, I, I feel like that's a really good policy. But to them, it's like, you know, if we're, uh, if we suspect a guy of like, you know, some drug offense and then uh, we see that he's speeding, we can't use that as a reason to pull him over and look for something else. And like, it's sort of a, to them, it's, it's hurting them and doing their job. Um, and so what I'm wondering is, um, is there anything being done to sort of bridge that gap where they don't feel like the policies are against them and they can see the benefit for the community? Um, and then also, like, is the problem the incentive structure? Um, yeah. So, so um, that's a terrific question. The, the, you know, we conduct debates in this country in an unbelievably unhealthy way. And it's often, you know, you're pro-cop or anti-cop or you're, you know, sometimes I think it's like you're pro-safety and security or you're pro-liberty. And I always wonder, you know, I'm both. You know, I, I, have, I tell people I have young kids. I live near uh, the World Trade Center. I want to be safe and secure. I want my kids to be safe and secure. And I also want to live in a society where we have liberty and we treat one another respectfully. And, uh, and I hate that we divide the world up in that other way and then think about things that way. So. What the officers are talking about is it has become very, um, it became very common in the United States to engage in what was often referred to as proactive policing. That meant lots of stops, lots of pedestrian stops, lots of traffic stops. And, you know, cops will tell you they can stop anybody. You follow somebody for just a little bit of time, there's, the, you know, a thousand things wrong that you could do wrong in the vehicle code. It's easy to pull people over. And then they'd get consent. To search, and I, you know, I looked at data from LA at one point, one quarter, I mean, one half of a year, and nineteen thousand some hundred people were asked to consent, and three people didn't. Uh, so you wonder if how voluntary that consent is, though you do also want to meet those three people. Um, and <laughs> and uh, and you know, that's a deci decision for us to make. As a society. I mean, first of all, there are constitutional problems. It's not clear that you should be pulling over a lot of people with no cause. The meaning of living in a uh, liberal democracy like we are is that you have a certain amount of liberty and that shouldn't happen. But that's the exact question, which is that we don't, we don't say, how do we want to fight crime while we talk about being worried about crime? We don't have a conversation about the how part of that. And we all ought to be in that conversation. And we should include the police in the conversation. Everywhere we go, everything we do, we hold focus groups with the officers, line officers, the brass. Uh, they should be part of the conversation. But I hate the notion that they have the ownership over that question or feel that they have the ownership over it. Uh, remarkable documents sitting on my desk from the fraternal organization, the union in Chicago. The superintendent in Chicago, in the middle of all the uproar, new, new use of force policy, sends it out to the public to, you know, they had a cool online program and everybody could kind of add comments and edit. And the fraternal organization was outraged. And they sent out this email that basically said, I mean, they used this phrase, the world's turned upside down. The superintendent's taken our use of force policy and asked the public what they think. And all I could think was, how crazy is that, asking the people that you're going to use force on what the policy should be for using force, right? I mean, it wouldn't strike any of us as crazy. And that's, that's just something that's broken, and that's exactly the thing that we're trying to fix. You know, how to fix it? So this will be my, like, my pitch to all of you out there about. So this front-end accountability is really difficult because we don't have any structures for doing it in the United States. We're making it all up all the time. And when you're making it up all the time, there are a lot of questions that tread into the world in which you live and where all of you can be helpful. So we are working often in very marginalized communities, and there are inadequate ways to conduct participatory democracy and to do it in a way that people aren't 
uh, having to come to a meeting when they don't have time to come to a meeting and they got kids to take care of and we need to have an easy way for people to have input and the platforms aren't very good. We want to know if what we're doing works and to figure out what you're doing works, you need to do a lot of surveying and the platforms for, you know, there aren't platforms that allow police departments to easily go in and get into their geocoded parts of their community and say, how are we doing? Like, how's the new policy affecting people to test legitimacy, to test trust, so that we can see over time whether we're making any progress. It just doesn't exist. Um, huge data needs. So one of the things we're looking at is, you know, there are measures of, of, of the impacts of policing that people just have never thought about very much. So we want to kind of go in and ask in communities where there's been this kind of proactive policing, are there effects on, on public health? What about education rates, dropout? You know, obviously uh, um, offending and arrests. And so there are lots of opportunities to engage in this project. I, I mean, I commend Deborah for all the suggestions she had locally, but those same problems are multiplied through 18,000 different policing agencies. I don't know if you want to add anything. I just went on and on there. Sorry. I'll just throw in that I think we confront the same kind of problem that we confront with other groups that are essentially segregated from one another, and that is that we don't know each other and we don't come into each other's territory, whether it's black and white or cops and civilians or whatever it is. And so I think it's incumbent upon those of us who care about those things to take those steps and try to meet each other where we are. Um, for my office specifically, we uh, administrate an alternative dispute resolution. I would way rather see a cop spend an hour in the room with a facilitator talking to the person who had a complaint against them than get a five-day suspension, because I think it's worth that much more. I kind of think we need a truth and reconciliation. I don't know what that looks like, but I think there's enough damage that really stems from slavery, you know, in particular, that, that we have more dialogue to conduct before we're going to be able to meet. But someone like you is invaluable. You know some of these people, but you also have uh, you know outside perspectives. You can take your bubble and their bubble and make a bubble bath. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> it may not work as well if I do the bubble bath thing. Yeah. Well, so um, all this talk, uh, first, a great talk, by the way. Thanks for both of you for coming, to both of you for coming. So all this talk is about kind of expanding the, um, the oversight over the police, over the law enforcement. And one of my con the concerns I have is that there is no equal oversight over the citizens in terms of organized crime, for instance. In other words, we are restricting, we're tying the hands of the police, but we are opening the hands of the organized crime. And what are your thoughts about expanding the oversight one way or another over suspected criminals. So maybe require that the information where they go is just as public as the policeman or anything like that so that we can kind of counter the, the other trend that actually as we weaken the police, and I've seen that in other societies, the police weakens and the organized crime strengthens. So, so that's a hard question. It's particularly difficult in part because we don't empirically know whether we're empowering criminals and limiting the police and where the optimal level of enforcement is. I mean, you're exactly right. There's some optimal level of enforcement, right? The law and economics folks around me would say, you know, we just have to figure out the optimal level of enforcement. I, by the way, I just want to say, I'm not sure I want to, you know, limit the police more. I want to change the nature of what we call oversight. In fact, I don't like the word oversight for a lot of what we do. I mean, I, you know, Deborah does oversight, but on the front end, I don't think of it as oversight. I think of it as, you know, collaborating on figuring out what the rules should be for exactly what you're asking. The other thing is, you know, technology has actually addressed some of that problem. So this is the question you're going to plant, and I'm now going to relieve you of planting it. But so the, I um, guess we're not supposed to let people know that either. So, uh, so the policing's changed dramatically in the last 30 years, and I don't think anybody noticed it just like you know, technology swept over all of us and we just kind of adapted but didn't, you know, then you have your whoa moment. So policing used to be all about suspicion or a lot about suspicion, which was that you knew, so you had a reason to think that somebody was doing something wrong or had done something wrong. And the Constitution was written to focus on suspicion that way. So we think about probable cause, right? Why is the government after you? Because we have enough facts, probable cause to think you've done something wrong, enough to justify getting a warrant to search you. And it was a very suspicion-based model. But if you think about the way that 
policing looks today, it's very different. It's a deterrent-based model, which is that we're gonna conduct sufficient surveillance over all of society that we've got an eye on you. And you know we have an eye on you, and hopefully, you especially, uh, we're gonna behave, right? And so, and so we're, all gonna, we're all gonna pay attention. And so we're gonna collect everybody's telephone metadata. And you know, it's not just being used for national security. That information can be queried by the FBI. It's a real, it's a real problem in the law. Um, we're gonna have airport security. We're just gonna get everybody to march through it, right? There's no cause to think anybody's got a weapon. We just, we spend a, a ton of money on the theory that we're gonna keep people from showing up with weapons in the first place. And so we actually have a ton of surveillance right now. I mean, one of the big questions is location tracking, right? We're all telling the police where we are with our phones at every moment, and we have inadequate legal controls on getting that information. So I'm not sure where the balance is, and I don't think any of us knows because we don't tend to think about things in this world uh, in any kind of scientific, careful, thoughtful way. We just have a lot of public rhetoric, and I think that's a shame because I want us to be free and I want us to be safe. And I published a piece in the Outlook um, section of the Washington Post a few weeks ago that you know, just asked the question, we spend $100, $100 billion a year on public safety, ought we to know what works? And so I'm with you, I wanna be safe, but I wanna have a better understanding of actually where we are with that. Thank you. Hello, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, so my question is about, um, you started your lecture with a bunch of examples where police clearly misbehaved or we would call it bad police and then extreme examples. Um, what's the mental model that you have about those cases? Is it like few bad apples, few yeah, bad no. districts? Is it like most of the districts are bad? Like what's it's bad the policy. There? It's, it's bad policy. So, and it's suboptimal policy. So that's the point. So, um, y you know, we, a lot of the problems that I showed at the beginning, I could walk you back through and, and show you how a, a more sensible policy would have avoided that problem. And if you thought that some of those were problem, you know, I mean, think, just think about the amount of time and uh, loss of human dignity and discomfort that's associated with forcibly catheterizing somebody, right? So I don't know if we ever want to do that, and I'm not sure that we ever want to do it for the crime of driving under the influence. And if you were going to get me to thinking we should ever do it, we maybe should do it, you know, if there's a tragic accident, right? Uh, but that's heavy-handed police behavior, and it's taking a cop off of their patrol where they be, may be missing something far more serious, right? And so um, the police shootings, every, every one of which is an extraordinary tragedy. And I just want to point something out to you, which is that we view the people who are shot and their families as you know, the center of that tragedy, which is exactly right. But we often don't think about the fact that, you know, and cops will tell you this, that you know, the cop who shot somebody's life is destroyed. And sometimes it's justified, but their life's still completely turned upside down by having done it. We don't want those things to happen. And so instead of just focusing on who we're going to punish, we should be asking the question, how are we going to avoid it in the first place? It's a suboptimal policy, right? And so, I mean, that's what I'm all about is, is data and, you know, optimization. And that isn't how we've approached policing. It's not how we've approached technology and policing. I mean, Deborah was talking about this. You know, what happens is what agency's got a new gadget, so then the next agency wants it. And they're not thinking, do I already have something that does that? Or am, I, am I thinking about how the data is getting, what the cost of storing the data is going to be, how I'm going to use the data? So it's exactly the right question. Uh, and my soapbox, I'm sorry, is that, you know, I think that we should stop always looking on the back end and looking for blame when things go wrong and say, let's optimize policy so they don't go wrong and we're actually getting things right. I get that argument. My, my question is a little bit more specific. When I walk into average department in the country, would I observe, what's the extent I would see? It? Like, are there really few bad departments? Most of them are. I'm using the term bad um, loosely here. Yeah, I get it. But, but uh, like, what, what's that distribution? Are we trying to fix few localized problems, or is it universally even and pretty much have to fix the whole system? I'm going to answer a little bit similarly. And it's subjective, I understand. Really yeah, well. so one thing I would say is I don't think there are bad apples, I think there are bad orchards. And the what makes up the orchard are some of the things that um, Barry mentioned. Um, what kind of policies are in place? What kind of training is in place? And all those things contribute to the ultimate thing, which is the culture. What is the culture of the department? And so, you know, uh, for the most part, I think that 
police departments that have not had the benefit of the sunlight shining upon them, whether through litigation, the DOJ, civilian oversight, whatever it might be, I think most of them are problematic. Not because they've done something bad already, but because they don't have the policies and trainings in place to make sure it doesn't happen. And um, you know, when a shooting happens, the lens, and so I, one of the issues that Eves and I just talked about a little earlier on October 21st, 2016, a woman was killed by King County Sheriff's deputies on the Muckleshoot Indian Reservation. They were, it was a wellness call. She was suicidal and they were coming in response to that and things went terribly wrong. There's gonna be an inquest in Kent. It starts May 22nd. And what they're gonna do, the purpose of an inquest, which is used in very few jurisdictions, but King County is one of them, is to get the truth out under oath, what happened. But citizens find that process very dissatisfying because they get out what happened and then what next? But as they look at that, they're gonna look, was it justifiable? But the lens we need to have is, was it preventable? And so when I look at a department, is it good, is it bad? What kind of policies and training do they have in place to prevent the most common kinds of tragedies? And I would posit, and I don't have the numbers on this, but that the mental health or behavioral health crises stuff is the key place where we need to be focusing resources because that is such a breadth of what they deal with. Also related to some comments you made, I wanna say that we as a society need to decide, do we want police to enforce minor things? Do we want them to stop Michael Brown for crossing, walking down the middle of the street, Sandra Bland for her broken tail light, Eric Garner for doing whatever he was doing, you know, hanging out on the streets? My answer is no, I think we have over enforcement. But then what happens to those quality of life things? How do we address those? Because we do care about them, we all do. Um, so we have to come up with other systems and we can't keep recruiting people to be armed cops jumping out of helicopters when actually they're social workers. That's what the job is. So rethinking the job description seems critically important to me and then hiring on that basis and having the community understand that what you don't want enforced, we're gonna have to find another answer for whether it's something you lobby for in Olympia or something that you implement as a community. But a lot of that rests with us. We've put these problems at their feet and they're not trained or equipped to deal with them. I want to give you just a slightly more precise answer because I appreciate the precision of the question. So it's kind of remarkable. So the NYPD is about 35,000 officers. There are plenty of departments that have one or two officers. I think the median in the country of the 18,000 departments is 10 officers. So it's quite a distribution. Uh, you know, what surprises you when you get into policing is how uh, it's kind of like you're walking into the past and how things haven't moved along. And so, again, I don't think they're bad. They're not modernized. There's been nothing to cause modernization. And to the contrary, what happens is we'll starve departments for, for cash sometimes, or it's just used in bad ways. Um, and you know, here's another thing. This is a money-making thing here, here at Google. So you know, there's a lot of talk about transparency and data, and we don't have data on policing. So it's hard to have data on 18,000 separate entities. That's tough to do. Uh, but one of the reasons, you know, and so the story we tell is, well, we don't have data because the police don't want to give it up. I tell that story in the first few pages of my book. I believe that to be true. But a lot of it is just like an embarrassment of data in the sense of they don't, you know, we decided that we were curious about stop data, demographic stop data, and where would we get it? And well, there's some departments under court orders, so we'll just call them up and see if they'll share it or they're supposed to share it. We literally called up some departments and they said, yeah, we'll get it to you. What's your fax number? And you know, they're ready to like fax over their sheet of their figures. And so I actually think that we'd have so much more policing data if we had the tools developed to collect the data and I think there's a real financial opportunity here, which is that there are 18,000 departments, and I think they would use many similar platforms, and then we would have unified data. But it's really, it's really a, it's, I mean, there are some bad apples, but that's not the right story. It's just, it's just you know, where modernization didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. You want to stop us now. Stop us before <laughs> we kill again. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you, guys, really. Thank you.